Before we begin, thank you very much to Park B for joining my Patreon campaign. Thank you very much for the support. It means the world to me. Thank you so much for the help. Thank you everyone for helping. It does help a lot. It does keep the channel going. Keeps the lights on, literally sometimes. Uh, and I thank you for supporting everything that I do. Um, we are like... We are approaching like four and a half months where it's just nothing but shout outs every single day. We're running low. So if you wanted to keep up, then please pitch into uh, please consider pitching into the Patreon and helping me out, even if it's for a little while, even if it's just for one buck this month only as a joke. All of it helps and all of it's appreciated. Uh, and I'm throwing some new benefits in for Patreon soon. I just have to work out some uh, some technicalities, but more is on the way. So. This wasn't a request, but it was an interesting thought experiment that was posted to me. And that was about the Dinobots, in that a lot of times, the Dinobots are kind of written to be essentially one character. There's small nuances that separate them, but for the most part, they're supposed to be depicted as the most unified team of Transformers. They're all like-minded, they very rarely infight in any fiction, uh, it is a very tight-knit group. If you mess with one, you mess with all of them. So the Dinobots have always, uh, even since the G1 cartoon, always been kept pretty similar to each other to really kind of emphasize that unified team mechanic. But they are characters. They're supposed to be characters. And, and you know, in and of themselves, sometimes they can be a little bit thin. So the thought experiment is this, what would I do to make the Dinobots distinct from each other and make each one their own character? So there's a lot of thoughts and a lot of directions we could go in that. So yeah, this is kind of akin to one of my rewrite videos where we're going to take the Dinobots, the base core concept of the Dinobots, and let's expand on it a little bit and see exactly what I would do to separate all of these out from each other. And some of it is going to be just, you know, kind of emphasizing what they already do. But we're going to expand on it a little bit and try to flesh out who these characters actually are. So in that, we do have to start with G1 Grimlock. Now, in the original cartoon, we do pretty much get like the like the well, with all of these, we get the traditional. Obviously, the G1 cartoon is the traditional appearance and the depiction. But in the early season, in season one and two. You have Grimlock at probably his most iconic, where he is very gruff, very egotistical. He knows how powerful he is, and he believes himself superior to Optimus Prime because his power is that much greater. Um, you know, he's either jealous of Optimus Prime, by his own admission, jealous of Optimus Prime, uh, or just wants to be very anti-authority and really thinks he should be in charge so no one has to boss him around. Now, Season 3 Grimlock is a very different beast. Like, somewhere between 1985 and 2005, Grimlock found a very fun-loving side of himself. He didn't really like his robot. He stayed in beast mode most of the time. Uh, he was far more comical. He got along with everybody. He never questioned Rodimus Prime. Ironic that. So, yeah... What do you do differently with Grimlock? Well, I think with Grimlock, you take a little bit from the Marvel comic book run. And this is how Grimlock is depicted, you know, every now and then in the comics. Now, these days, Cyberverse and, and from what we've seen so far, Earthspark, Grimlock is going to be a very different character in modern depictions. So we're going to take it to somewhat to basics here. For Grimlock, I think you keep the speech impediment. Uh, you just, you don't make it a sign of his idiocy, you just make it like a vocal tick, like a lot of G1 characters had. And you kind of throw in the fact that he's also highly intelligent and very tactically minded. He's a very competent leader on a battlefield. In fact, if it, you know, if it weren't for their difference in methods, he would rival Optimus Prime as a potential leader of the Autobots, or the very least, like the top commander of the Autobots. What separates him and Prime is, of course, Grimlock has attitude problems, and Grimlock has strategies and tactics that just fly in the face of what Autobots are supposed to stand for. He's far more direct than Optimus Prime, far more brutal than Optimus Prime. What he wants in a battlefield is to get things done quickly and efficiently, which means 
there's a lot more collateral damage to go around. So it's those methods that separate him from being Optimus Prime, and ultimately what keeps most other Autobots kind of shunning him away as far as any kind of aspirations for leadership go. Um, yeah, he's just a little bit more, he's just a little bit too brutal, a little bit too direct. Um, I mean, that's things that, you know, that can be like honed over time, you know, you know, event, you know, that can, not we've seen Grimlock like that and eventually he's kind of cooled down and, uh, kind of changed his tactics a little bit, but for my depiction, yeah, that's kind of the direction I like, uh, you know, definitely like an Optimus Prime rival type, just if he was more concerned for what was going on around him and less, con you know, more concerned about, you know, accidental damage and death, he'd probably be as good a leader as Optimus. That would be my Grimlock. Now, Grimlock's kind of easy because he's usually the one that is different from the others. So let's go into some of the others. So what do you do with Slag? And yes, I'm going to use Slag for this video because that's the traditional name. We get very little of the other Dinobots in G1. The only real note we get of Slag is that he's always eager to fight. He's more hostile than the other Dinobots. But truth be told, in depictions, in the, when they're all together as a group, he's not really depicted as any more violent, brutal, or quick to fight than any of the other Dinobots. He's just kind of there, spewing fire in beast mode. Uh, so if you take another depiction of uh, Slag, what do we do? I definitely make him, I definitely go with that, and I do make him the hothead of the team. That's the true, that's more traditional about how to stretch out the character. Um, yeah, and that makes sense, you know, he's the first to charge onto the battle, which makes, you know, the Triceratops mode make a lot of sense. Uh, he's by far the most aggressive of the team, he's the most brutal of the team, and he's definitely the one that wants to be first in the fight and last one standing. Um, combat and violence can be a personality type, <laughs> I mean, it's, I mean, it can be, it's pretty brutal for an Autobot. And one thing about the Dinobots here is that they've all, they're all kind of like shunned away from typical Transformers. Uh, one thing I do want in this batch of Dinobots is I don't want them to be like all built around each other to be a team. I want them to come from different times, different periods, different, you know, walks of life in Cybertron and somehow come together and figure out that, hey, all of these misfits kind of make a perfect little puzzle picture. It's a found family thing. Uh, so that's, you know, so we don't really have to have, you know, you know, we don't have to have like, uh, everyone's built together. Like we can, dif we can differentiate, you know, you know, we can technically make like slag the youngest of the team so that that hot headedness makes a little bit more sense. And as he grows and matures throughout a storyline, he's going to learn to hone it, calm down, approach things a little bit more, a little bit more intelligently. Um, that would, you know, so you have room for growth in a character in Slag. So, uh, what about Sludge? Sludge is another one where we get just a brief glimpse of him being a little bit different than the other Dinobots. But in his case, it is to push the stupidity boundaries. Um, at times, Sludge in the original cartoon is depicted as barely smart enough to function. Um... You know, where, where he's trying to figure out if the faction symbols on their chest meant the ones on the ground below them were the friendly ones. And those are the ones you don't shoot. Like, it's things like that. Uh, it's how easily led he is. Like, as long as it's the strongest leader, he will follow the strongest leader. Things like that. So, you do kind of emphasize that in a re-depiction, but you kind of play with it a little bit more. Yes, you keep him being the dumbest of the Dinobots, but you inherently me make that as uh, someone who is also probably the Dinobot that's easiest to get along with humans and others. Partially out of gullibility and just not knowing any better, I feel like he'd be the one that's easiest to take advantage of and like trick into something. But when it comes to just like being friendly, I think that's where you put Sludge. I think Sludge should almost fit an animated bulkhead style role where he's just this big lovable lug you know you know and he's just nice to be around now for dinobots that would be a detriment like that would be a detriment uh because you know of course 
they don't need nice on the battlefield but in battle you can't fault how you cannot fault how effective he is he is by far the strongest of the dinobots because thanks to his beast mode he's a little bit bigger than everybody else a little bit brawnier um yeah so you know it's one he's one of those characters where if he was as smart as grimlock he'd be the team leader but no he's the dumbest one on the team he follows grimlock without question um but yeah he's just he is the lovable lug of the team you just cannot help but like the guy and that would make him get along with humans pretty well i think more so than the rest of the dinobots so that's where we get him that's where that's where i think sludge falls as far as like a new depiction and like separating these dinobots we get a little bit harder with snarl because snarl gives us almost nothing to work with in the show for a while i thought he was going to be the smartest dinobot because we, when he's introduced he refers to himself in the first person he calls himself i i am snarl none of the other dinobots use that phrasing that was a first and then in later episodes they'd correct that he'd be back to me snarl like all the others so that went out the window and he just kind of feels like he's in the background you know, he doesn't really seem to ever really shine on his own so what do you do with essentially a blank slate um you can play with it a little bit so hear me out what if we remember these dinobots all come from different walks of life what if we made snarl the oldest member of the team he's been around and seen more you know millions of years worth more than the other dinobots he's got wisdom on his side uh he is a big strong silent type he does not say much uh you know he toes the dinobot line he'll follow grimlock's commands and he'll be very effective in a fight um you know he's you know very much like i have you know studied battle for millions of years i know just where to hit you with this spike to completely disable you like a very much a not no wasted motion type of combatant very efficient at it too so as far as personality goes he is the type that when he speaks all the dinobots listen you know even slag will just stop what he's doing and he will take in whatever snarl is saying because if it's worth if it's worth snarl opening his mouth for it's worth listening to it can be life lessons, it can be words of wisdom, it could be pointing out tactical flaws that Grimlock or the other Dinobots had not considered, but whenever he speaks, it's important, and whenever he, whenever the Dinobots listen, they go with it. They have learned to respect the word of the wise, so that is where I would put Snarl in this team. Definitely, like, the most aged, the most experienced, and yeah. You listen when he speaks, and if you don't listen, you will regret it. That you know, list not listening gets you that tail spike, that that thagomizer, right in that spot in your neck that completely disables you for a week. Yeah, that's what happens if you don't listen to this snarl. Meanwhile, we go into the easiest, which is Swoop. Swoop always my favorite Dinobot. So I thought Snarl would end up being the smartest one, but it turns out it's probably Swoop. You know, in Dinobot Island, when they get stuck in the tar pit, it's Swoop that manages to get out and get everyone else out. In Desertion of the Dinobots, it's Swoop that manages to get away and get to Carly and Spike to figure out how to save the other Dinobots. In Speech Pattern, yes, he's still kind of depicted as just as dumb. But in the way he's portrayed, he is actually seems to be the more clever of the bunch. Now... In this situation, I think the perfect swoop has already been created. I would go with the Cyberverse depiction. You know, super intelligent, rivaling even that of Perceptor. Um, and I thought this character was highly entertaining for a Dinobot. And I don't even mind gender flipping. Like, the fact that they're, like... Honestly, yeah, like, Dinobots are a team that could stand a female presence. And, like, I think Swoop makes a pretty appropriate one. It does fall into the girl is the smart one trope, but for the Dinobots, I think it works. And to be the aerial Dinobot, who is also the smart one, also kind of makes sense to me. 
Like the fact that she could even be the big bruiser, you know, one of the big bruiser Dinobots and still be able to fly and observe the battlefield from overhead, I think would speak to her intelligence. You know, so it makes sense to me. Like, I already think this is my favorite depiction of Swoop ever, and I want this to be, like, the permanent depiction from now on. Because I like G1 Swoop, I like Cyberverse Swoop, just a little bit better. Now, that's the main team, but after all, there's plenty of Dinobots that we've seen since then. We can expand on this list now, we can throw Slash in, Slash being another female on the team. Due to the size and swiftness of her beast mode, Slash would absolutely be the infiltrator of the team. She's the one that can uh, get in and out of a, of a facility with intel so the Dinobots can properly storm it. She is the one that can slip on and off of battlefields in order to bring uh, tactical information to Grimlock so they can properly strategize their approach. She and Slag would not get along. They are absolute polar opposites of each other. And the only reason he doesn't scrap her is because she is a no-nonsense, business-first type of woman. You don't mess with her. I don't care if she's a quarter of your size. You do not mess with Slash. Because what's going to happen is you're going to take one shot with that gun, one swipe with that sword... It's going to miss, and then you're going to lose an arm as her blades start slicing into your, your most soft joints. That's Slash. You don't mess with Slash. But yeah, as a team infiltrator, I think she makes a lot of sense. Uh, and then we have our newest, my boy. <laughs> I really hope Scar gets some kind of recognition and it's not just a filler for the eventual uh, Dino King repaint of those Dinobots. I really want them to do something else. I don't think we're going to get like a, a leader class, even as a remold of one of the other Dinobots. Like, pipe dream. Pipe dream that that would happen. So far, literally the only Dinobot they've added to the team that's gotten more than one toy is Slash. You know, the Age of Extinction, and then uh, Power of the Prime. So I don't really... I know that sixth spot on a Dinobot team is always suspect, but this one, like, this adds something. He is by far the most armored and heaviest set of the Dinobots, and he's the medic. All right, so the Dinobots need a medic? So you work with this. What, what, you know, what would a Dinobot medic be? And then I start to see that weapon that's basically just a fist with a barrel on the end, and I stop seeing that as some crazy weird style of blaster. I start seeing it more as an Energon injector. In Ankylo mode, uh, Scar can get onto the battlefield, take a million shots without any of them, like, phasing him, get to a fallen Dinobot, inject some Energon for a quick heal and recharge, and get them back to battling again. He would not be the type... He would not be, you know, as far as medics go, he'd be the, like, get back on your feet soldier type. Not the, like, let's get you back into, let's get you back and get you fully repaired. He's capable of that. You know, part of having that big shell would be nice to carry some of the troops off the field uh, if absolutely necessary. But if he can just, you know, if he can just, like, quick patch you up, inject some energy on and let you go without ever leaving beast mode, that's what Scar would be. And being such a heavy tank of the team that can take that much punishment and still get on and off of the battlefield, even at a slow pace, that kind of makes the name make sense too, doesn't it? And I'm sure we can continue with this. I mean, I, someone will get mad if I don't mention Paddles. Paddles would be the outlier of the team. Paddles is the loner. Paddles is the one who spends more time getting to know the local humans than being a Dinobot. Completely pacifistic. Uh, paddles would be the one they need very rarely since he's completely ineffective out of the water. But if they need underwater reconnaissance or recovery, Paddles is literally their only option. You know, and he's just an agreeable Dinobot to be with. So it's it's more of a... he's Like, as far as his found family goes, he's going to be far more like the outlier of the family. You know, we see, we see him at Thanksgiving and he's nice to... He's always up for, a, for doing you a favor, but beyond that... He's not really like a full-fledged member of the team. There's there's kind of where Paddles lies. 
and I'm sure we can continue. We can go into movie Dinobots if we want to. They'd be like the rogues, the outliers, the ones that even Grimlock can't keep control of. Um, you know, and you could go into even like crazier ones like IDW Straith if you want the machine or monster approach to her story. But I'll let the rest of that just be speculation for everybody else. I think coming up with an eight Dinobot team, you know, I, I think that works out for now. But there's definitely those little traits that you can expand in order to make all the Dinobots far more distinct than they actually are. It's just up to an animated project to actually depict it. You can do it in comic books, but when there's no voice acting and like actual motion behind it, I think it impacts a lot less than just texts and pictures. I'd love to see a full set of Dinobots animated again with all of these distinctions in place, without them feeling like they're all kind of written to be mostly the same character. To be fair, even Cyberverse kind of did that with the bulk of the team. So, those are the ideas. That's my crew of Dinobots. Uh, let me know what you thought in the comments below, and I will see you next time. We're gonna have to get your names for the books. You, Payo One. William Curant. Roll me a deception check. I thought their name was Payne. Roll a disadvantage. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was like that was like the opposite of the help action there. You, Goblin. Uh, first name D's. <laughs> Watch your tongue. <laughs>